Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to the most influential conservative talk show in the world. It is the Exceptional Conservative Show, live from the nation's capital. I'm yours truly, the Exceptional One, Ken McClinton. We're ready to get started. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a big, big show planned for this particular evening. Uh, part of which deals with, are there absolutes? Are there moral absolutes, in fact? And we'll talk about that over the next hour. And then in the 10 p.m. hour, the second half of our program, we will be talking with two very powerful speakers. One at the 10 a.m., forgive me, 10 p.m. moment. Uh, we'll be talking with none other than the Kraken himself. We'll release the Kraken onto the world again, as it is Wednesday night. Uh, you should wear your Santa suit tomorrow, Air. I Okay, for you, Mary, I will. Uh, at 10 p.m., ladies and gentlemen, we release the Kraken. Uh, none other than the great Ralph Chittam Sr., who is the D.C. GOP Vice Chair uh, and at 10.30, we will release another superstar. She will take center stage. Shannon Wright from Baltimore, PA. Well, no, not really PA, but it's Baltimore nonetheless. So <laughs> oh, man. Uh, we might be experiencing some difficulties with live stream tonight. I don't know exactly what's going on with it, but we will upload tonight's Ustream. Uh, to the live stream to make sure that you get a live uh, feed. I uh, want to thank also in our chat room this particular evening the beautiful, the brilliant Mary Brockman, my bouncer extraordinaire. Listen, if you diss her, you diss me and you will be whoop, dismissed from the program. Just as simple as that. Uh, also, Deborah Blair, thank you so much for being inside. Uh, the SHR Media Live at the ExceptionalConservativeShow.com. We love you. Glad to have you here tonight. You're becoming more conservative every single day. But the great love that I have, my beautiful, benevolent, and brilliant bride, none other than Mrs. Big. She's watching via Ustream and live stream. I don't know if the live stream thing's really working tonight because my I'm not getting any feedback from it, so I don't know about settings. We'll check on that. Coming up, we're about 48 hours from Christmas. Tomorrow is Men's Day. Yes, every single man in America goes shopping the day before Christmas. So I know all the women have finished shopping. This is the part of the program where we take off our hat. We find our right hand and we lift it and we put it upon our heart in the midst of our chest. And we begin our program uh, with the recitation of a great and honorable thing, the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States of America. And we're led this evening by Senora Cabrera. Uh, and if anyone gets a chance, if, if you would do me a great favor, I normally don't do this. Well, actually, I do, but normally not for this particular purpose or circumstance. Uh, but there are some mean-spirited people that have written stuff on Senor Cabrera's YouTube page. And I started today uh, thanking her for her patriotism. And if you would go there to that YouTube page and thank her for her patriotism and for doing this, I greatly would appreciate it. And share it around the world and let other people thank her as well. Uh, it, is, it is really our opportunity to take advantage of every opportunity given to us to expose the world to Christianity, to conservatism, constitutionalism, and capitalism. And when people are doing it and don't know it, it's good to point it out and encourage them. Senora Cabrera, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Buenas tardes, niños. This is the Spanish with Senora Cabrera. Today we will learn how to say the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish. In English, we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, in Spanish, we say, Juro 
fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la república que representa una nación bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Muy bien. Muy bien. Practice your pledge of allegiance. And the more you practice, the faster you will memorize. I'll see you later. Ah, uh, Senor Cabrera, we are so thankful for you being a part of our lives. Every, almost every single night on the Exceptional Conservative Show live for the nation's capital. Uh, and we encourage everyone to go to that YouTube page and thank her and encourage her to continue doing such patriotic work uh, as teaching in Spanish the Pledge of Allegiance as well as in English. Uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, who are coming to our set and enjoying the fruits of all of this great labor, a labor of great love and admiration that I have, uh, I want to uh, give you all some news, if you all don't mind. Uh, I, I know a lot of people uh, might think that I'm being braggadocio. Uh, and uh, after five years uh, of doing this, it, it's, it, you know, we, we don't get any awards for doing this. I, I mean, I know other conservatives get awards and stuff like that. And no, I don't get that kind of stuff. I, I get a lot of grief and gruff for the stuff that I do. Um, but I, I, I do want to say this without a shadow of a doubt. This has been such a great, great week um, over the past, I mean, I mean, just the past week. A tremendous week because we're beginning to get some notoriety uh, some uh, for our on-air work. And that notoriety is showing up uh, at Reverb Nation. And at Reverb Nation, as of today, you know, I made the big announcement yesterday about us being in the top 20 in three categories. As of today, as of this morning, the Exceptional Conservative Show for Spoken Word is now in the top 15 uh, globally and nationally and we are number one in Washington DC and, and this is I am honored at Washington DC we're number one nationally we're number 14 and globally we are number 15 we are growing by leaps and bounds people are beginning to express and come to our particular site and we are excited by that that is it <sighs> I am truly, truly excited um, by the fact that people are beginning to find uh, this, uh, appreciating this work. I really am, I, without a shadow of a doubt. And so um, I, I want to say thank you to all of you who have been tuning in over the years, who have been putting in the paces with us. Uh, and for those who are tuning in and coming to the Exceptional Conservative Show dot com at nine p.m. Eastern Standard Time to listen, uh, I have been told by Dan the Man Butcher at High Plains Talk that the podcast numbers are off the chain. Uh, it's the viewing numbers that I have to work on, apparently, uh, in terms of uStream, uh, and uh, we'll work on that. We'll work on that. People are getting used and acclimated to me being on this particular site. But nonetheless, uh, I am very excited by the news that I've been getting. Uh, and for those who are consistent listeners to our program, and certainly for those who drop into the ExceptionalConservativeShow.com, the SHR Media Live site, uh, it is at that site uh, that in fact, uh, since this is SHR night, Wednesday night, I don't know if they're doing a show right before Christmas Eve. I don't know. We do it. We are the hardest working conservative talk show in the world. I like to say that because I don't think we really take any days off. I think in five years, we're taking probably about four or five days off. Um, well, no, actually, we took a month off earlier this year so. <laughs> 
But after five years, that's not bad. That's really not bad. But I want to thank everybody because that, the news is just getting better and better. More and more people are listening to us. More and more people are tuning in around the world. Uh, more and more people are listening to the Exceptional Conservative Show. Uh, and we want to encourage everyone to keep doing that and to spread the good news around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to focus um, the next portions of our show uh, on the subject matter of our worldview. Our worldview, uh, basically, uh, our system of beliefs and assumptions and preferences, those idealisms are based or founded on basically two principles in worldview. Uh, founded on one worldview that God first. The second worldview is man first. And we've talked about what we are, uh, what are we, uh, and that was last Monday. Uh, last Tuesday we talked about were we created or did we evolve. Last Thursday we talked about our purpose. What is our purpose in life? Yesterday we talked about, I'm sorry, uh, Monday we talked about uh, does God exist? Tuesday, or last night, we talked about from where do we derive our morals. Tonight, our focus is on are there moral absolutes? And then finally, the last question that we're going to deal with is tomorrow night, Christmas Eve, why is there suffering in the world? And I just think that is one of the most timely moments where we can discuss this. Uh, we will also be getting a sneak peek, I believe, with the underground professor uh, for New Day Black and Red. We'll just throw one in the books for recording purposes. Um, but tonight, are there moral absolutes? Uh, and I, I wanted to start off uh, basically with this particular concept here. Our morality is built on whether God is first or man is first. Whether God is first or whether man is first. That is how our morality is built. And some people will say, well, Ken, that's kind of, you know, I believe in God, but, you know, we're men. No. The order matters. It matters because even those who don't believe in God, the one true God, find it necessary to create codes and systems of beliefs in place to keep order and discipline and structure. Now, when we take a look at the concept of morality, and the founding fathers. I want you to get a concept of what our founding fathers thought about on Jesus, on Christianity, and, and on the Bible. Mind you, because it's my show and I believe I can talk about Christianity. I, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe if I was on someone else's show I wouldn't be able to talk about that, but uh, quite frankly, knowing what they knew or what they talked about opens the door for us to exhaustively experience why they chose the course of action they did and why they pursued the philosophies of God rather than the philosophies of men. Let's take a look at John Adams first. John Adams, and I want to thank the good people at Wall Builders for making this provision available to us. We'll put that in the chat roll for people to take a look at. But John Adams who was a brilliant man and the signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a judge. He was a diplomat. He was one of the two signers of the Bill of Rights. He was the second president of the United States. This is what John Adams said. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I just want to, right there. Your founding father is telling you what cheat sheet they used to put everything together. It was the general principles of Christianity. And he goes on to say this, I would avow that I then believed and now believe 
that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. Principles, God, together, foundation. And I want you to get, get this understanding together because we're going to talk a little bit about standards in just a little bit. But immutable means unchanging, unalterable, opposite of. Opposite of what? See, I want to make this very plain to you. If in the Latin, immutabilis means opposite of, that means that there has to be something that exists in order for there to be opposition. There has to be something. It's like gravity and inertia. Gravity is pulling down, inertia pushing up. There's opposite, equal and opposite. Maybe not necessarily completely equal when we talk about spirituality, but nonetheless, there's an opposition that's taking place. The principles of God are just opposed to the principles of men. Let me digress back to John Adams. John Adams says, without religion, this world would be something not fit to be mentioned in polite company. I mean hell. You think you got it bad now. If it were not for Christianity, Christianity, if it were not for in the way, which is what Jesus referred to, what the Romans now call, Romans called Christianity. Uh, if it were not for in the way, this world would be, of all things, most miserable. There are not enough bulls to kill in order to make sacrificial, uh, acceptable sacrifices unto God. Uh, there are not enough pigeons or doves. It's just not enough to satisfy sacrifice. And praying to a rock will exhaust you and make you futile. It would be a living hell if it were not for Christianity. In fact, John Adams goes on to say, the Christian religion is above all the religions that ever prevailed or existed in ancient or modern times. I want to stop here. I want to put a, put a pen right here. The reason I want to put a pen right here is someone out there just said, well, what about Mohammedism? Christianity existed before Mohammedism, and John Adams is speaking after the knowledge of Mohammedism. The Christian religion is, above all the religions that ever prevailed or existed in ancient or modern times, the religion of wisdom, virtue, equity, and humanity. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book, and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. What a utopia! What a paradise would this region be! I have examined all religions, and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. John Adams! John Quincy Adams, his uh, son, uh, and he was a diplomat. He was Secretary of State. He was a U.S. Senator. He was a U.S. Representative. Uh, old man eloquent, hellhound of abolition. abolition. He was the sixth president of the United States. This is what John Quincy Adams says. My hopes of a future life are all founded upon the gospel of Christ, and I cannot cavil or quibble away, evade or object to, the whole tenor of his conduct by which he sometimes positively asserted and in other continences permits his disciples in asserting that he was God. The hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Can I put that in the chat room for everybody? Because I, I've been at many stores with my wife over the past few days, and each and every time I have said Merry Christmas, and only a minority of individuals responded back Merry Christmas. Most of them said, oh, okay, you too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Apparently, the world has trained people to separate their faith from themselves. 
even at the most celebratory periods of our lives. The hope of a Christian is inseparable from his faith. Whoever believes in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures must hope that the religion of Jesus shall prevail throughout the earth. Never since the foundation of the world have the prospects of mankind been more encouraging to that hope than they appear to be at the present time. And may the associated distribution of the Bible proceed and prosper till the Lord shall have made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And that's not coming from Isaiah 52.10. In the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior. <sighs> Do you understand? Now, I, I, I'm going to repeat that back to you, but I, I want you, for those who heard, do you understand why they do not want you to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? I don't care what, what, what time of the year you pick it. It doesn't matter. But why they do not sincerely want you to celebrate the birth of the Savior. Uh, but why not? Can, I, I mean, it's not that important. It, it's just the Savior. The birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior, is what John Quincy Adams says. There could be no birth of this nation if there were no birth of Christ, is what he's saying to you. The declaration, I'm going to finish what he says. The Declaration of Independence laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. Remember Isaiah 9, 6, and everyone's going to that about the government shall be upon his shoulders? Well, guess what? The Declaration of Independence was built upon the framework of the government being on the shoulder of Christ. That men, not as theologians, but as servants to a young nation, would seek his face, humble themselves, so their land might be healed, and that they might prosper. Let me go on. Uh, Jacob Broom, who was a legislator and signer of the Constitution, in a letter to his son James attending Princeton University, he wrote, I flatter myself you will be what I wish, but don't be so much flatter, flatterer as to relax of your application. Don't forget to be a Christian. I have said much to you on this head, and I hope an indelible impression is made. An encouragement to a son. What was the encouragement to the son? To be a Christian. But why a Christian? Why a Christian? Come on, why a Christian? Congress, 1854. This is Congress, 1854. Okay? And, and this is in the Journal of the House of Representatives of the United States of America, Washington, D.C., Cornelius Wendell, 1855. It is the 34th Congress, the first session, page 354, January 23rd, 1856. These words are uttered. Let me go back up there real quick. To do, to do, to do, to do. It was really uh, dramatic, though, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Exceptional Conservative Show live on the nation's capital's most influential networks. Okay, going back up there. Okay, there we go. This is in Congress now. And I want to put this in the chat roll. Okay, because a lot of people say I make stuff up uh, when I'm debating uh, the great Dr. Michael Hughes. Uh, he wants to know what text I'm talking about. Where is the proof? Well, here's the proof. I just read it all to you. This is what Congress said in 1854. The great, vital, and conservative element in our system. Wow! Conservatism, 1854. What a funk. The great vital and conservative element in our system is the belief of our people in the pure doctrines and the divine truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me explain something to you, all you down low listeners. 
Not just because Congress said it, but because men know it. My wife joked with me earlier today about Scrooge and how Scrooge seems to be a conservative. Let me explain something to all of you. While that symbolism is used in modern era, ERA, the truth is this. Conservatism is close, very close to the expansion of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Even Congress knew that in 1854. That means the Democrat Party that existed as far back as 1854 realized that the only way that they could separate themselves from the Constitution is to separate man from faith. They understood that if a conservative was able to come on the air in their town, well, maybe not radio at that time, but definitely a soapbox in their neighborhood, and speak of the greatness of divine principles and truths in the pure doctrine of Jesus. I'm talking the pure doctrine. I'm not talking about traditions. I'm not talking about Christmas. I'm not talking about Easter. I'm not talking about the bunny rabbit. I'm talking about the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ, it would align itself with conservatism. It would never align itself with being a Democrat. So those who walk in the church on Sunday morning and tell you that they are Democrats or socialists lie to their faith. I said it, and I ain't ashamed to say it to you. I'm going to break it down very clear to you. You are lying to yourself and unto God. There is no way that you can be a Democrat and saved. I said it. You can take it for the great assault that it's worth. Because even Congress in 1854 realized that truth. But what does this have to do with moral absolutes? I'm going to tell you about that in just one moment. Could Congress have made that mistake just one more time? Well, yes, they did. Congress made that mistake one more time, and this is what they said, U.S. House Judiciary Committee, 1854. Let me put it in the chat roll, just in case on the download, uh, Professor uh, Superstar uh, Dr. Michael Hughes happens to be listening, so he can go back uh, and take a look for himself. But literally, literally, Congress said this, had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. Goodness gracious, glory be to God. I am so sorry, but I'm on fire tonight. This is what the founding fathers, this is what the men of that day were saying about Christianity, not about Mohammedism, not about Hinduism, not about all the other isms. They were talking about Christianity. And this is what they were saying. If they had a suspicion of any type that a president of the United States was allowing individuals to come in to personally attack a Christian, if they had a suspicion of any type to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. What they're saying is, I know you don't want to hear it because it's not politically correct. I don't know you. I know you don't want me to say it because then it means some. Uh, is we're not being nice, and, and if we would just be nicer and kinder, then our killers wouldn't kill us as hard. Are you kidding me? They knew in this 1854 about Mohammedism. 1854, there had been 1,200 years of Mohammedism by then. They knew. They had considered all of the religions, and this is what they say. Let me play it for you one more time. Had the people... During the revolution, during the Revolutionary War, when we went up against Britain, if they know or had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. That means that this revolution against Britain was not only a revolution to separate ourselves 
from the king of England, but to separate ourselves unto the king of kings and lord of lords. He goes on, they go on to say, in this age, there can be no substitute for Christianity. That was the religion of the founders of the republic, and they expected it to remain the religion of their descendants. Christianity, we are a Christian nation, and that's why when you come back, we're going to talk about moral absolutes and how they could confound you by thinking that if you believe in any old thing, any old standard will do. You're listening to The Exceptional Conservative Show, live for the nation's capital. I'm the exceptional one, Ken McClinton. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Jersey Joe from the Reaver Common Sense. You can catch me every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on shrmedia.com. That's every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, shrmedia.com. My name is Christopher Arnold. I'm the executive chef of the Duke Restaurant, and today I'm going to walk you through some of the meals that we prepare here. So we're making a big meal. We use a fresh Italian sausage. We cook here in sliced nuts. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no better option for the holiday season. Listen, stop trying to fix all that food, especially tomorrow. Don't do it. Don't. I, it's just not worth it. It really is. I, well, it may be worth it if you're trying to impress somebody. But even if you are, I'm far better to cater it uh, and use Infused Restaurant, 6339 Allentown Road, Temple Hills, Maryland, 207-48-301-449-9000. InfuseInfuse.com. Ladies and gentlemen, stockings for soldiers. It's waning days to get these gifts off to our soldiers. It was founded to help improve the morale and welfare of members of the armed forces of the United States of America deployed in harm's way. They accomplished their mission by sewing holiday stockings and filling them with special items for the troops. Many of the stockings that are sent are for a specific person. Yes, they actually have the name of the person sewn into the stocking. Now, many of the troops go whole holidays without receiving any gift at all. So this is a very special thing that they receive. 
We're trying to send a special touch of home as well as personal messages of support to remind our troops that we appreciate all they do for us and to let them know that they have not been forgotten over the holidays. We depend on the generosity of others to help us to accomplish our vital mission. Stockings for Soldiers Delaware Incorporated is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Now, what does that mean? It means your donations may be tax deductible. Now, you have to check with your tax professional to make sure that you haven't exhausted all that you can uh, donate and write off on your taxes. But once you've done that, or even if you have it, just go ahead and send a check anyway. Send a check to Stockings for Soldiers, Delaware Incorporated, 1911 Folk Road, F-O-U-L-K Road, Wilmington, Delaware, 19810. Not only will Stockings for Soldiers, Delaware Incorporated, thank you, but so will our soldiers. You know what I think? I think you forgot to lock your door. A lot of people do that. They forget. That's too bad because all crime needs is a chance. Don't give it the chance. It's my job to teach you to protect yourselves. Make it your job to learn. Write to box 6600 Rockville, Maryland. Oh, and one more thing. Lock your door and take a bite out of crime. Right swipe. It's gonna be a right swipe. This man just shaved his chest here into a heart. Oh, yes, don't mind. Right, right swipe. swipe right swipe. Right swipe. I kind of look like my sister. It does. But I know she's not. He's cuddling a kitten. Oh my god, I want to eat their faces. She's, oh, she's hot. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. That's a lollipop. Oh, that is not a lollipop. Let's swipe. Let's swipe. like an old man at a racetrack. Yeah. Gentlemen, I want to welcome you back to the most inspirational, influential conservative talk show in America. Yeah, uh, I'm telling you right now. I know, and they want to talk with you about Donald Trump. They want to talk with you about Jeb Bush, Hillary Clinton, Megyn Kelly. I know, I know. They want to talk with you about all those particular things and 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 Hillary Clinton. I listen. That's all becoming blah 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 stuff to me. It really is. And, and, and why are we even talking about it? it? Doesn't really matter to the primaries begin. 
all the polling or whatever. And you know, it what kills me is uh, we polled, uh, we're getting polls that say that Donald Trump, 50% of the people are just going to be embarrassed to vote for him. But they're going to still vote for him. They may be embarrassed, but you know, lots of people do stuff that they embarrass about while they're doing it. It doesn't stop them from doing it. You know. Um, so the bottom line is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm really, especially this time of year, I'm not into the blah, 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 blah stuff. I mean, listen, if you're tired of the same old conservative talk, you heard it at 9 a.m. this morning, you heard it at 3 p.m. this afternoon, I need for you to stretch your mind and grow your defenses in spreading the good news of conservatism. Listen, the best way to do that is by tuning to the Exceptional Conservative Show. And tonight we're talking about are there moral absolutes. Uh, and quite frankly, if you listen to us over the next few weeks, or if you have been over the past few, this has all been about education and about understanding what it means to be a conservative, what it really means to be a conservative, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a capitalist, what does it mean to be a constitutionalist? Uh, and, and listen, we will uh, definitely... Uh, Mary Brockman, my bouncer, says it ta it breaks her heart that none of her friends will even look at Ben Carson. You know, it's it's amazing uh, that you raise that. And I said last week, uh, he sent me a picture of himself. It, yeah, here it is. Here it is. He took sent me a picture and he signed it to me. Um, signed it again. Um, Although he's never appeared on my program, no matter how many times I've asked him to. Just saying. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to complain. I'm just saying. Maybe now that I'm in the top 15, maybe he'll take the phone call or something. Says, Dear Kenneth, you are an inspiration to me, a true patriot, and a shining example of the best America has to offer. Thank you, and God bless you, Ben. Uh, and, Mary, I want you to know something. Uh, you got the same picture. Thank you, Mary. All right. Uh, so I don't feel uh, no ways tied. <laughs> okay. Uh, they sent me this little flyer thing. You must have donated to him. I, Mary, I will never say that I did. I won't say that I didn't. Uh, but my good friend who's coming up at 10 p.m., uh, Ralph Chittams, is trying to get me to endorse him. You know where I am, Mary. I, I love me. Uh, some Ted Cruz. So, uh, but uh, Ben Carson is not a bad choice either. Uh, he would make a good president. They gave me 12 reasons why. I'll read this to you next week sometime. Um, stop giving my stuff away, Mary. <laughs> Are there moral absolutes? Moral absolutism is the ethical belief that there are absolute standards. Before we go on, I want to uh, discuss exactly what standards are. Okay. A lot of us say that we know what they are. Many of us don't really. Okay. Um, there are two nouns to standard. One talks about a flag or a banner. His banner over me is love. His standard over me is love is really what the song is saying. Um, and, and it's in reference to a flag or other conspicuous object to serve as a rallying point for a military force. Uh, we are on with Christian soldiers. What is our rallying point? It is the word of God, the Bible. It is our flag. It's our His banner over me, his word over me is love. But there's a second now, and that is the weight, the measure, or the instrument by which the accuracy of others is determined. Notice how, when you're debating individuals, they never use this one, which is definition number two, which is essential in terms of divining exactly what you're debating. It means the rule, the principle, or means of judgment. 
put that in the chat roll there. Uh, the weight, measure, or instrument by which the accuracy of others is determined. What is your standard? Is your standard Plato? Is your standard Nitschka? Is your standard uh, some modern day philosopher like Oprah? Is that your standard bearer? Is that the one by which you define your very being and existence? Or is it the living, breathing God? You see, moral absolutism is the ethical belief that there are absolute standards against which moral questions can be judged, and that certain actions are considered right or wrong, regardless of the context of the act. Thus, actions are inherently moral or immoral. I want to put this in the chat roll for everybody because I want everyone to understand what, what we're talking about about moral absolutism. I want you to understand that regardless what you believe, you can believe in Jesus Christ if you want or not. You can believe in a six armed, four legged individual uh, and call that person a god or whatever you, you whatever it is you could believe if you you could pick up a rock and call it a god but there's certain beliefs and goals of the individual of society and of culture that must adhere to universality it doesn't matter what god you believe in your god whether he tells you or not should make it well known to you that murder is wrong. Murder was unethical. And we're not talking about self-defense, and we certainly are not talking about uh, authorized conflict battle. We're talking about one unto another murder. That's wrong. According to the definition of moral absolutism, uh, it holds that morals are inherent in the laws of the universe, the nature of humanity, the will of God, or some other fundamental source. I subscribe to the will of God. So I put this in, in the chat roll, and uh, I, I want you all to use this particular definition, because I'm going to run out of time on this particular topic, I know, because there's so much that we need to talk about uh, in the waning moments of the show. But <clears throat> moral absolutism. Are there moral absolutes? Yes, there are moral absolutes. But it depends on whose standard by which you make that. Let me explain something to you. Even those who misbelieve, subscribe to the order of the universe, or at least the order of the universe. L.W. King translated the Code of Hammurabi. Okay, and this is what the translation said. It said, when Anu the sublime, king of Anuke, and Bel, the lord of heaven and earth. And I want you to stop right there. B-E-L, the lord of heaven and earth. In the Bible, Bel is referred to as Baal, B-A hyphen A-L, B-A hyphen A-L, lord of the flies. Okay, do you, get, do you understand that even people who practice witchcraft and uh, idol, idolatry, even they say that there must be order in the land? Let me go on to finish. He says, Baal, the Lord of heaven and earth, who decreed the fate of the land, assigned to Marduk, the overruling son of Ea. God of righteousness, dominion over earthly men, and made him great among the Igigi. I lie to you not, it is the Igigi. <laughs> they called Babylon by his illustrious name. Igigi is Babylon. Igigi is Babylon. So <laughs> I'll tell you, the stuff you learn as you become educated, <laughs> it's amazing. 
um, by his illustrious name and made it great on earth and founded an everlasting kingdom in it whose foundations are laid so solidly as those of heaven and earth. Then a new and bell called by name me, Hammurabi, the exalted prince who feared God, to bring about the rule of righteousness in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evildoer. See, even evil people understand that they're evil people. Did you ever think about that? Really? And, and there are t individuals out there that say that evil does not exist. Evil exists, people. Even evil people will tell you that evil exists. But they're not evil, it's the other people. Just saying. So that the strong should ha not harm the weak, so that I should rule over the black-headed people like Shamash and enlighten the land to further the well-being of mankind. Or Shamash, how way you wish to say it. This is Hammurabi. These are some of the codes. And in fact, when Marduk sent me, I'm going to finish the, the last line of this. When Marduk sent me to rule over men. Now, remember, uh, we talked about yesterday Frederick Douglass referring to the Democrats wanting to rule over people rather than to serve them. Uh, well, Marduk is referring to the fact that he wants to rule over men. He doesn't want to serve them. He wants to rule over them. So how do you rule over men? Well, you create an order and a discipline so that people will not infringe upon your rights. But it's okay for you to infringe upon their natural rights. So, you know. Uh, when Marduk sent me to rule over men to give the protection of right to the land, I did right and righteousness in and brought about the well-being of the oppressed. Wow. I did so well for the poor. Look at me. I rode through the neighborhood and waved. Here are some of the laws. Okay. <clears throat> if this is number six, if anyone steal the property of a temple or of the court, he shall be put to death. And also the one who receives the stolen thing from him shall be put to death. Wow. Wow. We talk about it. really this is this is severe. Okay. Uh theft ended up in death. Now we quibble over killing people by state law for murdering 20 people in a household, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but they said if you steal something from a temple or from a court, you, you, you're you going to die. Um, here's another one, number 11. If the owner do not bring witness to identify the lost article, he is an evil doer. doer. He has traduced and shall be put to death. Wow! <laughs> if, you, if you refuse to come forward and say that your stuff uh, <laughs> what's lost or stolen, you die. This is tough stuff. Uh, and this is just on the stealing stuff. Um, uh, here we go. It, number 24. If persons are stolen, then shall the community and pay one minute of silver to their relatives. So if you were actually practicing human trafficking, you would have to pay back the family for doing so. Uh, if a chieftain or a man be caught in the misfortune of a king, if his son is able to enter into possession, then the field and garden shall be given to him, and he shall take over the fee of his father. Wow. Uh, it, <clears throat> if his son is still young and cannot take possession, a third of the field and garden shall be given to his mother, and she shall bring him up. Wow, you lose because you're not old enough. Amazing. Uh, here's another one. Uh, if anyone be too lazy to keep his dam in proper condition. All right, I'm sorry, but this is a new, this might be a law that we have to institute in this country. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I think this might be a law. This is a, and, and this is Hammurabi now. This is some strict stuff on Hammurabi's part. Okay. Hammurabi said, uh, if anyone be too lazy to keep his dam in proper condition and does not keep it, if then the dam break and all the fields be flooded, then shall he in whose dam the break occurred be sold for money, and the money shall replace the corn which he has caused to be ruined. You better hope you're worth a whole lot of money, baby, because a lot of people will be coming out over those particular things. But listen. People who practice the evil of idolatry understood that in order to keep order, 
you had to institute laws. And that there was a morality involved that if the weak were hurt, the strong would have to pay. If the oppressed were broken, then the oppressor would have to pay. So if the evil ones know this, how much more than would those who walk in the light know this? I want you to understand that no matter what religion you go to, even atheism, which is a religion, all of them will agree that there are universal laws set in stone by which we must follow in order to keep the peace. Now, there are those who believe in moral relativism, the position that moral propositions do not reflect objective and or universal moral truths, uh, but instead make claims relative to social, cultural, historical, or personal circumstances. You know, it's okay if your kid gets murdered, um, but my kid, because I happen to be very wealthy and very influential, if my child gets killed, then I want immediate justice. That's not justice. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand there are those who wish to practice moral relativism and mislead you away from the jewels of being a Christian nation. There are those of us who believe in moral absolutism that right is right, wrong is wrong. And the standard can't be me, and it can't be you, it has to be God. A standard far greater than ourselves. Is there a moral absolutism? Yes, there is. Are you willing to live by a moral absolutism? Most people are not. And that's the perplexing problem. We want to thank everybody who's covering us on this particular program, Rebooting Liberty, High Plains Talk, SHR Media, The Voice of Liberty, Blueberry Stitcher. But tonight is SHR Media Night, and we want you to tune in and listen. Wednesday night is always the best for Sakia Sean, Sakia Clint, and, of course, Free Sako. We'll be back with more of the best in Urban Conservative Talk right after these messages. Hi, my name is Christopher Arnold. I'm the executive chef of the Duke Restaurant. And today I'm gonna walk you through some of the meals that we prepare here. Jack cheese to this 
Ladies and gentlemen, don't make the mistake of sitting home thinking that the burger is going to come to you. You got to go to the burger. 6339 Allentown Road, Temple Hills, Maryland, 20748-301-449-9000, infuseinfuse.com. A lot of people think that because I just talk about their burgers, that that's the only thing they serve. No, they serve a compendium, a compendium of great food. So please make your way out. Uh, to infuseinfuse.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what we do at this particular time. When we start at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on the Best Coast, we take off our hat, we put our hand over our heart, and we listen to Senora Cabrera in the Pledge of Allegiance. Buenas tardes, niños. This is Spanish with Senora Cabrera. Today we will learn how to say the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish. In English, we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now in Spanish we say, Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la República que representa una nación Bajo Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Muy bien. Practice your pledge of allegiance. And the more you practice, the faster you will memorize. I'll see you later. All right. And I will see you right now. You're listening to the Exceptional Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. We are not ashamed of the good news of conservatism, for it is the power of liberation, first to the Republican and then the <laughs> you already said conservative, right? Well, and then the socialists. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know what we do. We release the Kraken every Wednesday night, SHR Media Night. Uh, and we are calling up none other than the great one himself, Your Ralph. Call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message. Oh, system. right. We're going to have to hang that one up. Okay. Terrific. He is not there. <laughs> Ah! All right, so we will go with our next option. Do, 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 do. I think we're going to call her a little early, if you all don't mind. Let's see here. We're going to talk to Shannon right anyway, so. Uh, there we go. Okay. Let us pull up. To the bumper of Miss Shannon. Right. Let's see. Okay. We are contacting Miss Shannon Wright. Miss Shannon Wright, we are calling. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingy, three ringy dingy. For not being able to. All right, so she's apologizing for not being here. So we will just take that as a great assault that neither one of them will be here. We'll try her back at 10:30 like we have scheduled. Uh, Mary's telling me that Sako is no longer part of Sackheads, really? Because he was on last week. Yes, Mary, he was on last week. So I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I think it's kind of like the Temptations. Once you are a temptation, you are always a temptation. So. uh Let's see if, uh, try Ralph again. You want me to try Ralph again, Mary? Okay, for you, Mary, my bouncer, I will try Ralph again. <laughs> we will try Ralph again. Here we go. Do-do-do. probably out Christmas shopping with his girls. First time he's had his girls together in four years. Um, yeah, I didn't see him either. Uh, you know, so we'll see. 
we'll see what comes of this. But you know, when you are with your daughters for the first time in four years, are everybody in the same room together? I would choose my daughters over coming on this program. That's just my personal opinion. But uh, yeah, we are calling. The guy we like to call Dr. Ralph Chittum. We like to release the Kraken on Wednesdays. And he's probably with his family tonight. You know. Good evening. Good evening. We are talking with none other than Ralph Chittum, DC GOP Vice Chairman. Good evening, sir. It's a great honor to have you on the air with us tonight. Always a pleasure, likewise. Listen, you're with your family, aren't you? Absolutely. All right, and your girls are in town for the first time in what four years? Um, well, no, no, no. Well, the girls are usually home, but um, my 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 middle son is home with us this year for Christmas, and for the first time we've had him home for Christmas in oh, good lord! Wow! Yeah, usually eight eight to ten years. Yeah, he, he's, um, he's a musician. He travels the world, so you know it's very hard for him to get home for the holidays because he has concerts. So yeah, I'm I'm blessed that um, my family's together for Christmas. That's what the season is all about. It's about family. It's about community. It's about Christ. But don't forget that. Put Him there first. There you go. Well, congratulations to you, and we certainly don't want to disturb you during this particular holy season. But since you're here, let me just ask you a couple of questions, and they have to do with excellent. Uh, what exactly is going on with that particular scenario and situation with Mayor uh, Muriel Bowser? Well, the, the, the citizens of the District of Columbia spoke uh, through the Public Service Commission, and the Public Service Commission initially rejected the deal as being a bad deal for the ratepayers in the District of Columbia for Exelon to not merge with it, but to take over. Pepco. Let's understand terms here. It's not a merger, it's a takeover. Mm -hmm. And Muriel Bowser politicized the process by injecting herself into the situation after the Public Service Commission had already said no to the deal. So she um, had the director of what's known as Fresh Pack, which was supposedly an independent super PAC raising money to support her agenda, who also happens to be a paid lobbyist for the Exelon Corporation, get involved and make some phone calls to get the right people involved in the process. And lo and behold, the takeover is was resurrected. And now it looks like the takeover is going to actually happen. Immediately, district rate payers are going to see an increase at least twofold in their electric bills. Some people are going to see a threefold increase. And everyone is telling us that this is a good deal for DC because a few collect because of a few connected heads of nonprofit organizations have been bought off by Pepco and Exelon with a bribe saying well, you know, if we don't allow Exelon to take over Pepco, we're not going to be able to give you any more money. But if you say that this is good for the district, not only will we continue to give you money, but we will give you more money. So this is pay-to-play politics, dirty politics, you know, the old school Democratic machine at work here in the District of Columbia once again, and the people are getting screwed. The people are getting screwed indeed. But it seems that those who have been working with uh, Ms. Bowser are walking away with their pots full of gold uh, and other uh, connectivity along with that. And recently it became noted that uh, someone on Muriel Bowser's staff uh, actually was aligned with Exelon. Uh, and, and, no, 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 okay. no. Someone on her staff was a former executive ah. with Pepco, mm -hmm. who, when she retired, retired with a very nice retirement package, which included stock options. And when this, and if this takeover actually occurs, this insider in the Bowser campaign tends will get paid with a capital P A I D on her stock and her stock options. 
Okay. And, and the and the thing but is, all of this is but all of this is clear and legal and above board and the most transparent and ethical administration that Washington D.C. has ever seen on the local level. At least all as right. at least as uh, Vincent Gray or Fenty. So <laughs> in this regard, uh, what we have is pay for play. Uh, but there are, and there are ministers as well who've been bought off with this particular deal uh, in the East of the River community. Uh, is there any possibility of a criminal investigation uh, into this particular I matter? I would certainly hope so, because the former Attorney General Machen went after Vincent Gray with a lot less evidence that has been presented against Miriam Bowser and her influence peddler. So if they could investigate Vince, I, have, I can't fathom how they can't investigate Muriel. Mm. Mm. Now, Muriel... And here's another interesting factoid. Yeah. Considering that the current Attorney General has visions and dreams of being the mayor, I can't imagine that he's going to miss an opportunity to bloody her up. Wow. Wow. Uh, we're talking tonight with uh, the Vice Chairman of the D.C. GOP, Ralph Chittums. Uh, and Ralph, it, this is a very dirty thing. We'll be following this particular story. Uh, but you and I both know, uh, for all our years in Washington, D.C., things like this don't get done unless someone's greased. Uh, and I'm not, ma I'm not saying that she was. I'm just saying where there is smoke, uh, normally the nuclear fire has already begun. So it, let's take a look at that one. Uh, there is a gentleman also in Washington, D.C. who has found a way to get around uh, the marijuana laws. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of being a registered provider of marijuana. Uh, and apparently this gentleman has done it by uh, not selling marijuana specifically, but giving marijuana away in exchange for a donation. How does that work, sir? <laughs> it, it, it works because it's legal. <laughs> See, it's in fact not. We just lost. Oh, I would love to hear the answer to this Donation one. Donation okay. for the gift, that's on you. It's legal. <laughs> it's legal. And that's how stupid these Democrats are when they wrote the law. So literally, you, literally in the District of Columbia, you can get free marijuana if you make a donation to the drug dealer who gives it to you. <laughs> as long as it's couched in those terms and it is understood that you do not have to give him any money in exchange for the weed that you have been handed, yes. <laughs> as long as it's clearly understood that it's not a quid pro quo, you have to give me $10 for this bag of weed, that you can give me whatever you want or nothing at all, yes. Uh, you can give away marijuana and receive donations in the District of Columbia. It is legal under the law. Now, now tell me if that's not the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> this is the craziest thing. Washington, D.C., of all places, uh, and, and only masterminds would find a way to get around it. I uh, want to ask you on, on the last front here uh, regarding the District of Columbia. And regarding the nation in general, um, what do you believe were the biggest stories for 2015 uh, in, in the District of Columbia? Oh. oh, in the District of Columbia? Yeah, first district um, and then the world. Well, um, I would have to say finally um, the Attorney General's office um, saying we have no intention of continuing to pursue the matter against Vincent Gray. Um, at the top of the list is, um, is, is crime. Um, the the Relisha Rudd travesty that this little girl can disappear and no one knows where she is. The, the absolute sin and the shame that people can lose their lives in the District of Columbia and no one blinks at the fact that there are all of these unsolved homicides. And then the chief of police gets on TV and talks about, you know, D.C. Is, is one of the safest places to live in the country. Well, the problem with that is 
Yeah, if you can avoid getting murdered, D.C. is one of the safest <laughs> places to live in the country. That's a hell of a caveat. <laughs> If you can just get by murder, boy, you're going to be all right. Uh, what are the... You can avoid being murdered, man. You got it. Made and <laughs> you can live another day to pay to play. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, what exactly is the top stories for you for the world, uh, national, the world in general? Uh, for me, um, one of the top national, international stories is the fact that the United States, in conjunction with the United Nations, has embarked upon an international effort to strong arm third and second world countries into accepting the radical homosexual and death agenda that the United States has completely adopted as part of its culture. Um, the fact that our government, in conjunction with the United Nations, is blackmailing these countries into changing their own constitutions and violating their sovereignty under the guise of human rights to push a homosexual agenda and an agenda of death, which is abortion. To me, that is one of the biggest international stories. In addition to the ongoing story of Hillary Clinton's complete inability to have performed in any way competently on the international stage and how she is now trying to spin her failures into successes for what I hope will be a failed attempt at attaining the presidency. Now, now I want to ask you in, re in regards to that, um, because you're part of the GOP uh, and you have an individual uh, who is running in the GOP, Donald Trump, who used a very vulgar term in, in, in uh, commenting on Hillary Clinton. Uh, what were your thoughts, sir? Is, isn't that kind of unwise to use such sailor talk in describing the uh, former Secretary of State? The, the problem with me and the Donald <laughs> is he does not present himself in any way as a president. Mm -hmm. He is not presidential in how he presents himself. He acts like a petulant three-year-old toddler who pouts, calls names. You know, I know I am, but what are you? I know I am, but what are you? you know, he, this is not the person that we need to have sitting at a table in a negotiation with Vladimir Putin. Now, he may have the technical skills to negotiate. You know, I've read his book, The Art of the Deal. He, yeah. He's a great businessman, but he does not have the temperament to represent the United States of America on an international stage in a way that will bring back the credibility that we have lost after eight years of Barack Obama. Well, was he right in his criticism of Hillary Clinton when it came to her foreign policy? Oh, her foreign policy is a complete disaster. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. but, when you're the, but when you're the president of the United States, you can call a spade a spade, but you just can't do it like you're a preschooler. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm all for telling the truth, and, and you know me. Yep. I want to call it like I see it, but at least when I call it like I see it, I try not to make the attack personal. Mm -hmm. I'm going to speak to the policy issue. I'm going to tell you why your foreign policy a disaster. We have lost our influence in every region of the world. When Russia is now viewed as the nation most likely to defend the life and liberty of Christians on the international stage, and the United States is viewed as the nation, one of the nations most likely to persecute Christians, that is an absolute failure of foreign policy. I'm not name calling, I'm just stating facts. Now, if someone wants to sit across the table from me and argue that, okay, fine, let's argue the issue that the United States has lost its influence, we have dropped, we are no longer the leading economy, our currency is being devalued, there's a very good chance that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as the currency for international trade. Let's talk about all of that stuff, and then you tell me how Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's foreign policy is an actual success. You got that right, dude. See, I did all of that without acting like a petulant three-year-old. <laughs> but you know, come on! I, I mean, 
it, it, they were pushing Jeb Bush, who who looked uh, like a, a little gippy kind of guy. You know, you got the Donald versus the Jeb. Uh, and Jeb Bush is complaining that the Donald is abrasive. And apparently the people in America want abrasion after eight years of kowtowing and bending over backwards. I believe the people of America want someone who is going to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I also believe that America wants someone who is going to tell the truth, but who's also going to do it in a way that will maintain the pride and the dignity of the United States of America. Unfortunately, right now, the only persons telling the truth, you know, to the extent that people want the truth told, is someone who's being abrasive, so they're left with no choice. Wow. Now, there is talk uh, that the Donald is being pulled off of state uh, election uh, ballots. I, I don't know if that necessarily is true, but apparently uh, the GO... So, 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 last I read, there were five states who tried to pull Donald off the primary ballot, mm -hmm. um, one of which was New Hampshire. Um, they had a, a meeting in New Hampshire, a hearing. It lasted five minutes, and basically the person who filed a petition to remove Donald was told, take a standing full of chairs and sit down. This petition is worthless. He's on the ballot. There you and go. that literally took less than five minutes. There you go. So there is no sincere talk about third-party run for Donald Trump right now. Well, he said out of his own mouth, and if you want to take him as a man of his word, he said he wasn't going to do it, mm -hmm. regardless of what happened. That's what he said. Now, now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not Karnak. Yep. I don't, you know, I don't have any insight with this campaign or with the man. I just know what he said. Okay. Now, uh, I, there is another man who has a very strong following in Iowa. Uh, his name is Ben Carson. Uh, and but the recent polls, and I don't know how you can interview 400 people. And that'd be the poll for all of America. But nevertheless, the recent polls show him uh, fourth in Iowa behind Marco Rubio, uh, who never met a gang that he didn't want to belong to, uh, Ted Cruz, who would make a better Supreme Court justice, uh, and the Donald. So uh, exactly what chance does Ben Carson have in this election uh, if he doesn't win Iowa and he doesn't win uh, New Hampshire. Honestly, I don't think he needs to win. I think he needs to. I do think he needs to to, to have a strong second place showing. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that he needs to necessarily win both of those primary states. But truthfully, a lot of the problems that he's having inside of his campaign, you know, are is damage that's being done by surrogates. From other campaigns. Yeah. You know, if you look at the attacks that are coming at Dr. Carson, they're not coming from Ted Cruz, they're not coming from Marco Rubio, but they're coming from his surrogates. So even though they can claim a certain level of plausible deniability, you know, it's clear that there are insider attacks on Dr. Carson from other candidates who want to extract some of the evangelical support that he has to them because for a candidate like a Ted Cruz, if he doesn't have an overwhelming evangelical support, his candidacy is going nowhere. Exactly. And the only other candidate in the field who has a strong evangelical base is Dr. Carson. So in order for him to increase his base, his surrogates have to attack Dr. Carson. And that's and that's what they're saying right now. Well, based on the calendar, you have uh, New Hampshire coming up, you have Iowa coming up, you have uh, as well uh, South Carolina coming up, and, as, uh, and Nevada, of course, but Nevada's not as big as South Carolina, New Hampshire, uh, and Iowa because they set the tone for the nation uh, in terms of what conservatives are voting for and especially what the GOP will be voting for. Uh, the after the uh, 
the New Hampshire uh, uh, and Iowa. Uh, do you really think there will be as many candidates uh, or, or are we be looking at the final four finally coming out and it being the Donald, Rubio, Cruz, and Carson? Um, again, I, you know, there's no inside information. Yeah. Honestly, I think a lot of these guys are going to stick into the race. Wow. Simply because <laughs> they know that by staying in the race and by gaining just a few delegates, in states that are not winner take all, they can almost assure themselves of a broker convention. And <laughs> once you get to a broker convention, anything can happen. So I think a lot of these guys, you know, Rand Paul, Christie, um, Kasich, I don't see them going anywhere because it's not in their interest to go anywhere because once they get to the convention, it's the Donald doesn't win on the first ballot, all of a sudden they become power players. Because uh. they will be able to dictate terms in the back room where the guys are smoking cigars and drinking scotch. So there's no reason for them to get out. If their money people will continue to back them, you know, thinking that there's value in forcing a broker convention, what better way to have a broker convention than to have 10 delegates? 10 candidates on the ballot in each primary state. I think it almost becomes impossible for one candidate to win. Wow. So we are looking for a I, I agree with you. I, well, let me just say that I believe that we're going to have a broker convention, uh, and I just can't wait. I, I'm getting my popcorn all together for it. How can people, sir, oh, yeah. <laughs> get in contact with you? Uh, and first and foremost, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to your family and to Patricia. Uh, and 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 especially your young children who have come together uh, with you uh, and you. Uh, but how can people get in contact with you and get your insights on the politics of the world, the district, uh, and so be it all? Yeah, I'm on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, RJ Chittam, C-H-I-T-T-A-M-S-S-R. Uh, if you want to drop me a note. Um, my excuse is my email address, which is ralph.chittums at dcgop.com. And likewise, I want to wish you and the missus and all of your listeners out there a very blessed and a Merry Christmas. And no matter where you go, if somebody tells you Happy Holidays, look them in the eye and say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We are still a Christian nation. God bless you, sir. Give my best to Patricia. Will do. God bless you. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there is nothing better than having the great Shannon Wright follow up the great Ralph Chittum. And that's going to happen in just a few moments. You're listening to the Exceptional Conservative Show live from the nation's capital. We'll be right back right after these messages. Time for an unpleasant blind guy, conservative bite. <clears throat> when celebrities talk, though this shouldn't be the case, people listen and they act on their words. Recently, Quentin Tarantino appeared on MSNBC to answer allegations of bias against law enforcement officers, which arose from the following statement that Mr. Tarantino made at a recent anti-police rally. What am I doing here? I'm doing here because I'm a human being with a conscience, and when I see murder, I cannot stand by, and I have to call the murdered the murdered, and I have to call the murderers the murderers. The MSNBC interviewer played the following from Congressman Ted Poe of Texas. He referred to peace officers as murderers. His hateful rhetoric called for violence against law enforcement. I have to call a murderer a murderer, and I have to call a murder a murderer. Adding that he is on the side of the ones who confront and are confronted by police. His comments encourage mischief and crimes against peace officers. For the haters to justify lawlessness in response to perceived lawless acts by the police is idiotic. Do you have a response to the congressman? Well, that's not what I said. 
But that is what you implied, Mr. Tarantino. The implication is that as long as there is a white face attached to it, there is a bigot under every bed and a racist behind every badge eager to gun down non-white people for the simple reason of race hate. It's much easier to, to feign outrage and start arguments with celebrities than it is to deal with the fact that the citizenry has lost trust in them. More accurately, Mr. Tarantino, it is easier for people like you who haven't lived in the real world since the launch of your cinematic epic Love Birds and Bondage in 1983 to create pseudo fact as if it was a movie script and then try and impose your own particular style of social engineering on the real people of the United States of America who live real lives in the real world and who, unlike you, do not have armed security protecting them. They want me to shut up and they want to make sure that no other people like me, prominent citizens, will stand up for that side. This last statement, Mr. Tarantino, tells everyone anything they need to know about your character. You consider yourself a prominent citizen. Well, being one who is not unsympathetic and understanding that you haven't lived like the rest of us since Ronald Reagan was in the White House and Donna Summer was working hard for the money, allow me to correct you. This is the United States of America. We are all prominent citizens in this country. I will allow that in your Hollywood bubble and to those unwise enough to listen to celebrities as if they had some sort of special wisdom, you are influential. But every citizen, regardless of background of the United States of America, is a prominent citizen. I know you do not believe this to be the case, but the rest of us do. Your opposition does not want you to shut up. We extend to you, as we should, the right to free speech, which every citizen in the United States of America enjoys thanks to the sacrifice of the men and women of our armed forces. But we also expect for you to respect our right to speak freely, and this includes criticizing you. In the real world, sir, people receive feedback all the time, including me, and it's not always positive. That is how free speech works for all the citizens of the United States, including you. They're going to read what I said. They'll watch this show. They'll hear what I have to say. And I think they'll make up their own mind, and we'll see what happens. We certainly will. For my part, I will put the whole of Mr. Tarantino's MSNBC interview up at UBG Contact on the Twitter so that I will not be accused of taking remarks out of context. Mr. Tarantino, this may be difficult for you to believe. But it is not hyperbole when I say that all over the United States of America, right now, good law enforcement officers who treat everyone equally go on watch, knowing that people like you have helped to influence some people, that it is not only acceptable for them to commit crimes, but it is acceptable for them to resist law enforcement, even to the point of deadly force, rather than be apprehended for those crimes. Some of those people are armed, some are not armed. Mr. Tarantino, it is the duty of law enforcement officers to protect and to serve. If you wish to make the situation better, sir, might I suggest that you begin producing movies that do not make the commission of crimes look cool? Might I suggest that you begin supporting things like the Open Heart Closed Case Campaign? Might I suggest that you familiarize yourself with the cases of such people as Sharnice Milton, Rilly Sherrod, and Cecil Mills? Might I suggest that while you highlight cases that you believe portray law enforcement officers as murderers, you step up and address the problem of black-on-black -black crime? Mr. Tarantino, you can do a lot of good with your influence, and your words can do a lot of harm. But whatever happens, you can rest assured that police protection will always be there, even for people like you, Mr. Tarantino. This has been an unpleasant blind guy, conservative fight.
Hey, it's Jersey Joe from Creamer Common Sense. You can catch me every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on shrmedia.com. That's every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, shrmedia.com. Foresight Broadcasting. Listen to us at WNJCRadio.com. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, ah, I'm going to get in trouble for playing that. <laughs> that is the Conservative Commandos kickoff song. Ah, oh, ladies and gentlemen, yes, it is Rick Trader. You will find him on the air Monday through Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. on the Conservative Commandos Radio Network, WNJC. You will also find Jersey Joe uh, in the noontime hour on WNJC, 1360 a.m. I'm normally there on Fridays at 3 p.m. I am uh, most gracious to be in the presence of my very good friend, Rick Trader, uh, a benevolent man indeed, a benevolent dictator that he is, uh, and also my very good friend, Dr. Michael Jones, joins me on Saturdays at 5 p.m. for New Day Black and Red. So check out WNJC 1360 for the very best urban conservative talk and other conservative talk available. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not delay any longer. We are talking with... Uh, a very beautiful and brilliant young woman who should become the president of the Baltimore City Council. That's what my hope and dream is. Um, and I want to introduce to some to present to others, uh, Ms. Shannon Wright, better known as Pastor Shannon Wright. She happens to be in the chat room, uh, even at this particular moment. She's probably watching her son bake the cookies or whatever. Her son does all the heavy cooking and heavy lifting during this time of the year, and she watches. Uh, good evening, Shannon Wright. It's a, <laughs> it's a great privilege and honor to have you on the program with us one more time before the close of the year. Good evening. Uh, good evening. The honor is mine, and good evening to you. Uh, and I love your son doing all the heavy lifting and heavy cooking during the course of the holiday season. And watch, sure, you get to from Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you get to sit back and relax and enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Last week you came, you came out and made a huge announcement that you were putting together your uh, exploratory committee. And that you were considering a run for office? Was that just for the sake of being, you know, provocative on the air? Or how is that going? Well, a um, couple of changes. You know, um, first of all, forgive the background sound. I'm trying to keep the sound to a minimum. Um, well, we're not going to do the whole exploratory thing. All right. <laughs> Here's why. Here's why. All right. My mama didn't raise no public committee. Exploratory is just a way of sticking your toe in the test of water. We are jumping in. We are declaring. We are running. So All right. Congratulations to you. Uh, it is good. Uh, it is wholesome that you are running uh, for the presidency of the Baltimore City Council. Now, this is big news, especially across the country and around the world for people who are listening to this, um, because most conservatives uh, itch, whine, and complain. They never get involved in actual politics. Uh, why are you motivated to do this? Because I live in Baltimore, and when my children are here, I don't want to have to worry about where they are, what they're doing, and what could happen to them. There's some changes that need to be made in the city. And I'm not going to shy away from actually putting in the work. You know, like you said, a lot of times folks talk about it, write about it, you know, all that good stuff, but then don't do anything about it. You know, I hear a lot of Christian folks, and, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's 
just right before that holiday, I believe, which is still called Christmas. So a lot of Christian folks talk about, well, you know, I believe God is going to do what God is going to do. Yeah, God is going to do, but faith, faith without works is dead. So those who believe need to get up and do something. And I can't call folks to do that if I'm not willing to do that. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Listen, I want to get your comments first and foremost. Uh, because you and I agree that this has probably been a banner year for Baltimore. Uh, <laughs> oh, don't get the marching band started now. Um, but apparently, Baltimore's elected officials have voted themselves a pay raise. Uh, Rollins Blake's, the, the mayor, Stephanie Rollins Blake's income were raised from 167000 to 171000 uh, and the city council will see pay increases of one hundred and ten to one hundred thirteen thousand dollars. Now I want to ask you, with seventy five million dollars in debt for the quarter, uh, the pay raise already calculated out. Uh, the the seventy five million dollars circle, or are we now making it a larger shortfall? Because how 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 do you decide? You need to be paid more. See, if I got you, I understand that. But you're worth and worthy being paid more when you, oops, got a $75 million shortfall. How does that work? Amazing. How does that work? I, you and I both, as business owners, couldn't do that. <laughs> we just. No. We, <laughs> I'm trying to, wait, I'm trying to figure out how. <laughs> and see where I came from. One and one equals two. One and one don't equal ten million. So how do I That's that new school math I am not familiar with. Now, but I, I have to say this. Kent, Kent Bowles made this statement earlier today. He said, we're not talking about minimum wage jobs here. We're talking about people in very high positions in the government. In order for them to achieve a pay hike, it should be tied to strong performance. Well, is it, it, well, Kent Bowles being the chairman of the city's uh, Republican Central Committee, isn't he slightly off? I, I mean, they, they did show up for work. They did vote. Uh, isn't that enough for you all in Baltimore? I show up for work every day, and I'll be going, well, I'm looking for my pay raise. I hope that's not an increase. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for my pay raise. Well, I'm looking for my place. If that's how it works here in Baltimore, wow. I'm, just, I'm glad I'm here. Wow. And, and Let me just tell you this. Uh -huh. You know, there's a lot of things in Baltimore that need to be fixed, but there's a lot of good things in Baltimore, too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just to be serious for a hot minute, yeah. um, this is going to be an interesting, to say the least, year in running this campaign <laughs> and moving forward to actually trying to make a positive change here in Baltimore. And I hope he's listening. Because there's one person that I need to thank for giving me the room and the space to be able to do this. And that is my husband. Yay. Because he could, he could be very upset and displeased with the fact that it is really a wonderful thing that he cooks as well so we don't starve. <laughs> he could be displeased about a lot of the things that running a business and a campaign don't need much room and time for. But the fact that I have him, not just as my husband, but as my best friend, as my spiritual covering, gives me the power and the authority and the ability to be able to do the things that God has put my spirit to do. Exactly. And I hope that it's this holiday season that, that folks take a minute and give thanks, not just to God for still being here, but to the person who lays next to them, sits next to them every day for giving them the strength and the courage and the ability to go forward and do the things that they do and that give them the space to excel in the areas that they're in. So I just want everybody to give a little bit of thanks, you know, it's not thank you, a little bit of thanks to those closest to you that allow and encourage you to be all that you're supposed to be. So I, I wanted to put that out there. I think that's absolutely wonderful uh, and a point well taken during this particular season where people are hustling and bustling to try to give someone a gift that they have forgotten. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. what a wonderful, wonderful moment it is just to reach over and give somebody a hug, to show a little love. 
and, and I, I think that's one of the great Christmas songs. Uh, Give love on Christmas Day. Uh, Absolutely. You know that it's not just reserved for Christmas; it's an everyday thing. And your husband, Absolutely. your husband Mike, uh, is a wonderful man. I mean, just a wonderful man of God who truly loves you. Uh, I've seen it I, I personally, and I, I know him and his faith, uh, and I love the way he stands up to you. <laughs> it says yes. You know, he's looking right now. I know he's, <laughs> he's a great author, too, and I'm looking forward to him coming on the air in the new year about his books. Uh, and he has a, uh, a tremendous number of great books that he's written, and, and we look forward to that. Um, the big issue in Baltimore in 2015 has been crime. Uh, and there are those who feel that it is necessary to have a law enforcement officer's bill of rights, uh, as a part of an improvement to, uh, for the community and the police. Uh, and my thoughts to you on this particular matter, it, uh, amazingly, we already have a Bill of Rights, but we need a law enforcement officer's Bill of Rights. What's up? Is it is it, is it, is it just a problem with law enforcement? I'm going to get in trouble for this, probably, but I'm going to tell you. Law enforcement is the books. We need to enforce in a way some of the ones we already had. Instead of trying to find a way around skirting the issue and doing all kinds of, as my grandmother would say, who's strong job, to be able to get that thing to read a little bit closer to the way we really want it to. Mm -hmm. Now, in my opinion, that is, that is a part of the issue. See, Baltimore, though, see, I can kind of understand the officers wanting to have a bill of rights. Because Baltimore is special. You know what? In Baltimore, if you say for the street, everybody should have their own personal bill of rights. It should be on their face like that. Because yeah. things are just out of control. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have issues with the police. Yes, it's not a new thing. It's a thing that's been going on for a long time. But you know what? When you have a system where certain things become the accepted norm, you have to look at who is running that system. And in this country, we have, for the longest time, that two-party system, it's not the one, you know, where. But Baltimore, for longer than I have been alive, has been run by one party. And when you think about it, for all of your listeners that are parents, when two of your kids come to you arguing, he said this, she did that, she looked at me, she touched me, she did this, she that, you know that between what one child is saying and between what the other child is saying, somewhere in the middle is the truth. Yeah. Well, here in Baltimore, we only have one side. Exactly. Very well so said. One side is running amok, unchecked. You know, absolute power. We were talking about moral absolutism earlier tonight uh, in the first hour of our program. Uh, and that's because the standard is built on the will of God that you have moral absolutism. When the standard is built on just men and their philosophies, Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so there is a problem with corruption in Baltimore. Uh, and as well, that corruption is noticeable in the budget def deficit. You don't have a deficit unless you're spending more than you're making uh, and, and or bringing in. Uh, and, and in this particular case, I want to raise this issue with you, and, and then I want you to close this out. Uh, with what your hopes and aspirations are for 2016. Uh, but officials in Baltimore County and Baltimore City are in talks about reimbursing Baltimore County police for helping out during the unrest in Baltimore. Now, I know that there are two different jurisdictions, but shouldn't it just be an accepted understanding that if there is a riot or other circumstance that it is blatantly necessary to call in external forces that you need to pay for that that service uh, am i right on that well you would be right except again this is baltimore a city that you just talked about folks loading themselves with pay rates when they have a 75 million dollar shortfall <laughs> so i can't 
can't pay you for coming to bail me out of the situation I created if I'm trying to pay myself. To, quite frankly, paying myself is more important. So again, this is Baltimore. Now, I, I say that with a little bit of humor, but the serious thing is this. There are so many systemic issues in Baltimore that it would take it would take more time than I think any of us listening to this show perhaps probably have on this planet to really turn it around the way it needs to be. But some of the things that need to happen are people need to understand and get back to basic values, number one. There's something I like to say to people who don't like to hear it. The preachers in Baltimore need to get out of their own way and out from under everybody else's son, and the preachers need to preach. The teachers need to get back in the school and actually teach, and the parents need to parent. There are so many issues on so many levels here in Baltimore. And for me, one of the other reasons, again, why I'm running for office is because everybody that runs for office, for the most part, talks about what they would do, what they could do, and what they might do if they get elected. But my entire campaign is going to be about doing now what I will continue to do once I'm elected. And for that reason, that yeah, I've decided and some folks might have no issue with this. For the month of February, just to start to give us enough time to do it together, I want to spotlight folks here in Baltimore that are doing the right thing. Because you hear about a lot of folks that aren't doing the right thing. But there are some folks here that are doing the right thing, and I want to be able to spotlight and showcase them. But you're an everyday soul. Because I think in Baltimore, people's spirits have become so weighed down with all the garbage but they forget that there are still good folks out there trying to do good things. You're absolutely and right. And can be turned around. I agree with you. And I think you're the person to make it happen. Listen, uh, there are those who need hope uh, in yeah. this particular. We got about a minute to go before the close of this particular show. And I want to ask you, what word, what advice, what counsel, what, what say you to the people of Baltimore? in our nation at this time period where crime and terrorism are the two biggest issues. What say you in terms of comfort uh, in these most arresting periods? Have faith, hold on, be vigilant, and get up and do the work. Everybody, every individual has the power and the ability to change their community. They don't have to wait for somebody to become elected to do it for them. They have the ability to do it themselves. Remember, from where the strength comes from, and who is their source, and act in it. Shannon Wright, it is always an honor and a privilege. I want to extend to you and your family the happiest of New Year's, and most importantly, the merriest of Christmases. Thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you you and yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Shannon Wright running for the president of the Baltimore City Council. She made it official tonight. Uh, and I, I owe it all to you all and God. God first because it's his will and his way. But secondly, to you all. You all have been with me for five years. You have encouraged me uh, in the worst of times and the best of times. And now we're beginning to bear fruit. The seeds that we planted over the years that we watered with our tears and our frustrations are now bearing fruit. And now there are people who are coming forth, running for offices, and with the expectations of winning, not just placing and showing. So ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Tomorrow night, uh, we end our Worldview series, and we'll be talking about why is there suffering in the world. And a lot of people would ask Ken McClinton, why are you on Christmas Eve talking about suffering in the world? I want you to understand something. Jesus suffered the greatest suffering of any man in the history of mankind. And as God, he did so as well. Until we recognize that we know him in our his suffering we will never fully know him in our celebrations for all of us at the exceptional conservative show live for the nation's capital i want you to know that a man once told me don't do not live in fear for you would die a coward i promise you i never will remember always 
God has blessed America. Now it's time for America to bless God. We'll see you tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Good night. Stay in there for SHR. Sidekids Radio next. <laughs>